The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. What happens after Montessori? A question parents first getting to know Montessori schooling often ask is not seemingly about Montessori, but instead about what happens when their child leaves the school. Usually it goes something like this. What is the transition to normal school like? You know, you know, traditional elementary or junior high? And probably even more importantly, this one comes up a lot. Does going to Montessori as a child really have an influence in the long run? I think these are pretty thoughtful questions and you know I have a lot to say on them you know based on what I've seen over the years as well as on what I've heard from so many others. But instead of going into all that directly, I thought why not have someone on who actually did it? So a former Montessori child who literally transitioned to quote normal schooling. So with me today is Meredith Narroway who attended Montessori for preschool through elementary, so all the way from age 2 to 10. And then she made the jump to public school, staying in it until, you know, graduating high school. Now, Meredith is an adult now, so a grown-up, and she eventually graduated from Stanford University and has worked on all sorts of exciting and impressive endeavors since then professionally, mainly in and around San Francisco, where I happen to be right now. So I decided to have Meredith on for a few reasons, but there are three that I'll just quickly highlight. One, she actually experienced what many parents are concerned about. So again, their child transitioning from Montessori to public school and at a seemingly vulnerable age. Two, she is a great example of what a meaningful and lasting influence Montessori can really have on a person's life. And then three, I mean, this is kind of personal, but she just really made an impression on me the first time I met her. Uh, and I'll talk about that in the discussion she and I have in this episode. So without building things up anymore, uh, let's just hop right in. All right. Hello, Meredith. Hello. How are you today? I'm doing really well. I'm excited to be here and chatting with you about Montessori. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mentioned a little bit about Meredith before um, we got on here, but so Meredith went to Montessori school for a long time. So I think it was, what did you, two years old to about 10, you had said, Meredith? Yes, that is correct. Okay, preschool, awesome. Preschool, the very start of preschool through fifth grade. Nice. And I, I mean, I personally met Meredith briefly at a talk I gave in San Francisco. We were opening, trying to open a school out here, which eventually did open an elementary school, which is going really, really well. But she told, she came on as this kind of former Montessori child to talk to some of the parents, the prospective parents that were there. And I was just, I was like, this story she told that was just so cool. And it got me, I was in the back going, wow, I really like that story. So I thought, well, let me, let me catch up with Meredith. I'm actually in San Francisco now. So I thought I'd reach out to her and here we are. So, um, maybe to begin, why don't you just tell, if you want, tell that story that you had told at that event, if you're interested in telling that. Oh, I love telling this story. Nice. So I'm okay, very cool. happy to do it. Um, basically when I was in third grade, so when I was eight, the Montessori school I went to, which was the Montessori school of Maui, gave the parents an assignment, which was, I think, meant to help the parents think about Montessori education and what it meant for their kids. And also just to give them a little bit more trust in their kids mm -hmm. and what their kids were doing. And the assignment was very simple. It was just go into your child's room, dump out all of their clothes onto the floor and tell your child to organize it and give them no other instructions other than that, just that one small, small instruction. Um, okay. And then do not to give, not to interfere in any way until they were done. And then they were supposed to ask what exactly it was, how the so, kid organized it. So I've got to imagine this was probably like mm -hmm. primary class, like three to six year olds. Well, I was, I was eight. So oh, you were eight at this I time. I was eight, yeah. Oh, I, interesting. I double checked right. that with my mom actually before 
before doing this. Um, so yeah, third grade. I could see this. I guess, you know, with the older kids, at least they might be able to explain their, how they did it as opposed to just, oh, I did it, you know? Um, <laughs> right. But okay. So what, what occurred when your mom just dumped all the stuff on the floor? So she just said, okay, Meredith, go, go ahead. Why don't you organize this, do something with this? And so um, I said, sure. And I, went to the pile and proceeded to just start stacking clothes into different stacks. And my mom was getting really concerned because she could see no rhyme or reason whatsoever about why I was putting things into certain piles. Like it wasn't shirts, 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 or shorts, 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 shorts. It was like, everything was completely jumbled. Yes. It's like, what's wrong with my child? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Basically. I'm sure that's what was going through her mind. Um, and Eventually, I finished, and I looked at her, and I said, okay, I'm done. And she goes, okay, Meredith, can you explain to me how you decided to separate your clothes? And I looked at her, and I said, oh, sure. I, I arranged them by country of origin. Yeah, so yeah. what I'd been doing was I'd been looking at the tags of each of the hmm. pieces of clothing. And when I saw Thailand, I put things in the Thailand pile. When I saw USA, I put things in the USA pile. And when I saw Vietnam and so forth, yeah. they went in the Vietnam pile. Um, yeah, no, it's, and, go for well, it. I just, I just, I'd never, I, I dimly remember doing this and the results of it. And I never really thought about looking at my clothes in that way before. Mm-hmm. But after that, it made the clothes from the most more exotic locations much more appealing to me. So I had like this really kind of ugly utilitarian vest and short <laughs> set that was khaki that was from Thailand. And that was the coolest country in my opinion. So I wore that much more often after that. Yeah. And, and I- then after I was done with all the organizing by country of origin, I was very aware that that was no way to actually organize your clothes mm. like it wasn't efficient at all so i did reorganize them by shirts shorts pants etc oh wow i don't even you um, know, i don't even remember <laughs> that part but you know it's i i love that you actually added that because it's for me thinking about this like it's such a cool thing that as individuals we all have our unique little ways but even as you were retelling this i was like i love this story but then i was thinking but i know somebody out there is going to be like oh this is great like she's dividing these things uniquely but hey that's not really practical and you actually rearrange them afterwards as a child right right that's why i think this is such a great illustration of what montessori learning is like it's it allows you the freedom to follow your curiosity but it also provides you with the fundamentals at the same time to know how to function on a practical level yeah and i think that balance is what i often get from parents as the concern Um, they'll say it one or the other way it's either that you know i want my child to be more creative to have these outlets or it's that I want my child to actually know things, to be knowledgeable and not just kind of be like, oh, I do whatever I want and wander around. So what happened back then, it kind of has the balance of both. Um, yes. Yes. I yeah, feel at least like in your case. It's so. provi- yeah, exactly. For me, at least, it definitely provided both. Yeah. So in connecting this kind of with the Montessori classroom, and so it sounds like you were there for many years. So this is, this I would say is abnormal with, because a lot of parents still go from Montessori from maybe like three to five and that's, well, there's a free public school down the road. I'll just send my child to kindergarten afterwards. Like, what do you remember from your Montessori classrooms? I would say that the more, most overwhelming memory I have is just a sense of a lot of color and a lot of tactile things to do. I, my absolute favorites, as you might guess from the story of my clothes, were there were wooden puzzles that we had where we had to place all the countries of a continent together yeah. within the shape of the continent. And then there were others where you used flags to correctly label country names and capitals. And, and whenever I had that time or that space, to do exactly what I wanted to do. I was probably over there with those puzzles and just doing that over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, And those, I guess for people in the audience, those puzzle maps, if you don't know of them, I think I'll maybe after this, I'll add an image of it so that they have a sense of what that is. I think you described it, described it somewhat, but basically in Montessori kids can enjoy quote playing with these little puzzle maps, but in the process they're like learning all the countries in the world if they kept going at it. So it's pretty insane. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. Um, But I mean, those are my favorites, but I, Mm. it wasn't just geography. I remember the stamp game where we learned long division and the bead frame where we learned multiplication. And 
I also remember wooden cutouts of shapes where we that we used to diagram verbs and adjectives and nouns and other parts of speech and I just, sentences. Wait, I, have to stop, I have to step back because listening to you, like I thought, oh, I'll ask this question. Maybe she remembers a few things. But it's just, <laughs> what's crazy to me is like when I look back at my early schooling, I don't remember much of anything in terms of like what I was learning. I may be like sitting in a circle with some friends of mine and, you know, let's teach us reading a story, but I don't remember stuff like this. Now, I don't know. I, I don't think maybe I'm unique in the sense that I'm not remembering a lot from early, early childhood. But mm-hmm. it's just I find that Montessori children tend to remember things that other of, of us who did not have Montessori just there's no way we'd remember what we were doing at six years old. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not really fully formed memories. Yeah. Like I have like dim senses of things. Uh-huh. Um, but I do I do really think. It's just the fact that there was everything was just so concrete and you remember mm-hmm. them as games and you did them a lot. And so that just kind of fits into your to your memories. Yeah, because you're doing um, it over and over and over again, kind of. Is yeah. What you're yeah. Um, I should also caveat all of this with um, the fact that I was I really took to the Montessori method. Apparently, according to my mom, um, my teachers took to calling me Miss Montessori. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. Okay, so you're like know, the, the you Montessori know. child of all children. I, yeah, well. I was like a mo- model Montessori child. So okay. I don't know how well that relates to everyone well, else who might be listening, but it it was really I took to it very well. Yeah, I should say that. Interestingly, I'll get parents that will say, "Oh, my child's a Montessori child." You know, and if I dig into even um, I was researching some on Anne Frank, who was a Montessori child herself. And in one of the letters later on, years after everything horrible had occurred, her dad had written to her her teacher and she said, you know, Anne has always been a Montessori child. So that that term Montessori child, I think, is applied to many children. Mm -hmm. Um, But maybe you were uniquely Montessori child. I I don't know. We'll see. So who knows? That's that was my question. As you said that, I'm like, what does Montessori child mean? The same thing in every instance. Yeah, I think a lot. What I get a lot is that parents will say, "Oh my gosh, I get home and my child is just after being in your classroom Montessori for like a few months. Like they want to organize everything." You know, so there's this there's this desire to organize things. There's this structure. Or if let's say mom, you know, says, oh, we're leaving in 10 minutes and we're going to go. And then it's like 20 minutes later, the child's going to be like, you you had said 10 minutes. So, you know, and it's so I think children normally like a lot of that structure. But as they get in the Montessori classroom, they're extra aware of kind of order and structure and um, and what's surrounding them, even in their environment, like cleaning things up, that type of thing. So. Yes, um, that so. uh, resonates a lot, actually. Um, and I was 100% that person who was okay. like, come on, you said we were leaving. Yeah, so but there you go. <laughs> what's funny is my sister was also a Montessori student, and she was not necessarily that way, and she drove oh. me insane because oh, she was always running late. She's better now, <laughs> she says, because of my influence. But um, <laughs> So that's still a Montessori influence because you were the Montessori yeah. child, you influenced her, right? <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, But the other thing that I remember is also related to structure. And Mm -hmm. I don't really remember what they were called, but I do remember meticulously documenting how I spent my day in like work journals. I don't. um, Yeah. So maybe like, is it you with this when you were in elementary, right? Yes. yes, Okay. Yeah. So a work journal, a work contract, or a work diary, there's different names for them. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah. So what happened? What were you to remember on that? I'm sorry. Well, I remember we had to use rulers to draw lines to sell, uh-huh. separate one task from another so they would look very orderly. And uh-huh. I remember we had to use colors for all capital letters and punctuation. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and at the Montessori that I went to, at least, those journals were, they seemed to be constructed out of blank pieces of paper and what it looked like was wallpaper samples. So it was always huh. really exciting to finish a journal and get to pick out a new one from all of the different colorful fun Oh, options. you know, and I, that I, I actually, that's not something I know of as, as this is what Montessori is in the classroom. But I think that actually raises an, a point for me that Montessori, there's principles and there's guidelines for each, you know, like the classrooms across the, the, the world, basically. Like if you went into this classroom, you're going to see similarities. But what's so awesome, and I think this is just, it's whether in Montessori or in any school, so much is about like, who's the teacher in your classroom? Like, who's that human being who's actually working in the Montessori environment? So it sounds like your teacher, your guide, as they call them, mm-hmm. um, she probably recognized, as no doubt I've seen throughout my time, and I remember as a child, 
at this age, there's such an excitement with having your own unique style with certain things. Mm. Um, so journals, I've seen in different ways teachers do different things, but this is probably like, yeah, when you're done, you can pick a new color that's you, you know, that you really like. Um, yeah. You know, as opposed to like the, the, the me journal from Target or something, there's like 50 of them that every child has the same exact one, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure, I mean, I guess we got, had to write our name and everything, but I'm sure it helped us keep track of our own things as well. Oh, yeah, like that's my journal over there as opposed to Jimmy's or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. Well, nice. Um, and then the other thing that really just sticks out at me from my Montessori education um, or things that aren't really necessarily classroom related or like traditional learning related. But I just remember like in preschool, we all helped cook Thanksgiving d dinner. Yeah. Um, I worked on the black eyed peas. Like I remember very specific details about what I was in charge of. So <laughs> like when we planted a garden, I was in charge of dill. So I was, I really liked dill after that. How do you remember this? This is like, it was just, it's just these little things that stick out because it was it was my responsibility and I just felt so empowered I guess by being given that responsibility that that little thing just stuck in my brain. It's wild man because this is like one of the first times I'm in, an, in like a conversation interview like this where I'm like damn I wish I would have had because I'm like <laughs> I'm thinking to myself I don't there's nothing I remember at that I mean there's yeah. it's just yeah, that's really cool I don't like dill at all though as a side note. Oh that's, that's, yeah. I think I went back and forth about whether or not I liked it at a certain point. Now yeah. I do. Then you I do like really it. Yes. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah. And is it even with the cooking? So I got to say, like, it sounds like you had a very cool Montessori experience and a unique teachers in that environment that you were in because, I mean, and then again and again, it's like, there's also laws. So there's some places where you literally could not cook certain things because there's health laws in certain States and cities and so forth. <laughs> um, but that no doubt occurs that some children in some environments in Montessori, the idea is like, let's have them involved in cooking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I mean, in your sense, the Thanksgiving meal, there's, there's an element of community there. Hey, we're all coming together to cook something together. Um, and then, and this is what I talk a lot with parents about children that actually cook or prepare or get involved in making the food tend to eat the food that they're preparing. Um, and, I know, Meredith, you don't have kids now yet, right? No, I do not. Okay, so you haven't yet dealt with, I don't like that, that's gross, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but parents, this is such a, you know, constant problem with parents. And one of it is because you're choosing the food, you're feeding the food, you're giving them, the, it's never the child's involvement in making the food um, or preparing. So I think a big element of why a lot of Montessori teachers integrate that into the classroom is for this, like, I did it. Like you were saying, there's some, it's like, it was my job, my responsibility. So, you know, with the dill and so forth. So right. um, that's some of right. the, the background of why we do that in Montessori. That makes a lot of sense. That yeah. being said, I don't think I ever had black eyed peas after that. <laughs> <laughs> Not be, I just, it just wasn't part of our normal uh, food at home. And so. Have you had them as adult, as an adult now? No, like I see them it's and time. I like remember it has that memory associated with it, but I haven't actually. You got to go back now and try them. I think so. I think so. It's time. Um, uh, so I it, have one other thing actually. Oh yeah, go I'd ahead. I want to rush you through which it. Was the, um, I think that my Montessori at least uh, really capitalized on the unique environment where we were living in Hawaii. So they did a wonderful job incorporating field trips and guests that highlighted that local culture and the local activities that were available to us. Mm. And that's something that I really treasure about both growing up in Hawaii and going to that Montessori school, which is like we went on our field trips were to whale watches and we went onto a marine research vessel and helped with science experiments. And we went hiking and wildlife preserves and they brought in like a, what in Hawaiian is called a kupuna, who's essentially like an honored elder who's a source of experience and knowledge and guidance just to help educate us into what what Hawaiian means. Not necessarily the language, although we did learn a little bit of mm -hmm. that, but more about like just Hawaiian culture and mythology and our the community around us, which yeah. I thought was 
really smart and I was really glad and I'm really glad that they do that. Yeah. The sound, I mean, the more and more you speak about this school, which I didn't know a lot about, um, it sounds like they're just really deeply into like what helps children to develop and particularly about, Hey, let's build this into the broader world. So it's not just this, Hey, we're in a classroom and we're stuck here and then you go home. You yes. Know? It was um, phenomenal. Yeah. And I, in Montessori, a lot of, and I don't know if, was that in elementary? You think it was in the preschool ages? Do you remember? Or? I think that was all in elementary. In elementary. Okay. So I was going to say, it sounds more towards the elementary because that's, you know, they do these things called going outs in elementary, um, which is basically like a field trip, you know, but it's more about experience. And when it's done right, it's about experiencing like, hey, who's out there in our community? It's not like, hey, let's go to the science fair and just play with a bunch of random contraptions. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. let's really get a sense of who's out there. So, um, and clearly you're in a unique environment. You're like, yeah. like in Maui, Hawaii. So it's like you've got quite an, a surrounding. But just to be kind of straight about this, it really depends on where you're living. Because there's some places where this that could really be phenomenal, and there's some other places where, hey, you're you know somebody just put up a school just to get going with Montessori, and there's not a lot of opportunity for that yet, but it's you know it will get there. So, it, I'd say in this case, it really is depending on where you're living. Like for the parents out there or teachers, like I, I'd hate to be like, hey, look at go on a whale watching trip, and they they go <laughs> like, man, we don't have money to even like you know add a extra you know lunch to the to the program or something. So it's really dependent on what your resources are around you. Excellent point. Yeah. Um, what I did want to jump into, cause I know, you know, definitely now, particularly with parents concerned about, is my child going to be kind of prepared for the future, this type of thing? Cause what we're talking about, I mean, we've got some academics in there. We're talking about taking care of yourself, but you know, things like, you know, will my child be creative as they grow up? Um, and I know you had mentioned one thing that stood out with me is that you had talked about curiosity and the fact that you think it actually the, your Montessori experience aided you in developing that um, kind of throughout your life as an adult. But can you share a little bit about that? I think you mentioned it was like intellectual curiosity or something like that. Yes, absolutely. That is the one thing that I if I could say anything about my Montessori education and how it's helped me, it is 100% that, which is as a Montessori student, you don't really have tests, or at least I didn't have tests, we didn't have mm -hmm. grades, we didn't have homework. And the grades, especially no grades, meant that what we were doing was incentivized purely by our intellectual curiosity rather than any form of achievement that was associated with something other than a sense of personal satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has helped me enormously in my life since then. Um, I, and that's not to say that the desire to achieve and like do really well hasn't necessarily played a role in my life now or in the past, but it wasn't established as the primary purpose behind doing something. Yeah, and I should say, I want to just jump in because this sounds lovely to me because I know everything about what this means for a person's life if they're internally mm -hmm. kind of motivated and personally driven. Um, but when you say, I had no tests and I had no grades and it's, you know, some right. parents, say, oh, it's la, la, la. Just, can you just remind people where you graduated from? I don't like to do this type of thing, but just like to just be like, hey, you know. Yes, uh, I went to Stanford University. Okay. And, so it worked out pretty well for me. And, and you were all right there. You weren't like, you know, kids were like, look at this little girl doesn't know anything. Like it wasn't like that experience. No, no, it was, I did great there. I, okay. I graduated with honors and distinction. So um, I actually credit this intellectual curiosity that was being a big part about why I got into Stanford, which is. Um, in middle school, part of the curriculum that I was in, I was in public school at that point, there's this thing called History Day, mm -hmm. which was basically really big historically based research projects using primary source materials based on a given theme every year. So I did in seventh grade and did okay. I wrote a paper. And then in eighth grade, I partnered up with two friends, one of whom was my best friend from age two and a half wow. or two when I was at Montessori. Um, and another girl, and we decided to make a display board about sugar, yeah, the unionization in Hawaii and how migration to Hawaii helped create um, like a mixing pot of cultures, which later comes to define the state in many ways. 
Um, but we, we worked really, really hard on it. Um, there was like a lot of perfect elements that came together in many ways, but we, we ended up winning the national competition at age 13. Nice. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't talk about it very much. Um, cause I, I don't want it to sound like bragging or something like that, but it was, it was really exciting. Um, yeah. and and then, like it was part out of the curriculum, it wasn't really anything that we we had to do. So it was outside of what you, what your requirements were. Well, it it in seventh and eighth grade it was required. Okay. In ninth grade we didn't do it. In tenth grade, this other girl went to a private high school. I went to a public high school. Okay. And then for some reason, and I don't entirely remember how it happened, we just decided we wanted to do it again. So we had to find out if we could do it as students from two separate schools. <laughs> and and it wasn't part of our curriculum at all. And uh-huh. we brought in another girl who actually went to another high school. Uh-huh. Uh, and we did it again just because we wanted to. Yeah. Um, Man, this this story, because it just makes me think of like so many people. And I think about grades or test scores. I want my, you know, I want to be the most successful. And it's so it, what I found to be the case is that, like, let's take money. If you're not focused on money, but you're focused on like creating something really unique and getting it out there, you end up being the one who makes money, you know. And I think it's I think there's elements of this connected with like grades, where if you're not focused on grades and doing well on tests, but you just love to learn and you're in an environment where you're able to explore and learn you end up doing really well, or at least have the ability to do really well, grade-wise and test-wise and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this isn't 100% all the time, but mm-hmm. I've, I have definitely seen that in my experience throughout now being in education for so long, um, definitely in my own experience as a student. Um, when, mm-hmm. you know, when grades were the emphasis, it was like, well, I don't really care. And then when it became like, nobody's gonna push you to get good grades, it's like, oh, I gotta find what I really love doing or enjoy And then just go at it. And that's when my, quote, grades got, you know, were super high. Right. Yes. Exactly. Like, I'm not going to say that doing this in high school wasn't 100% just because we really wanted to do it. Like, I think part of it was like, let's see if we can win again. Or I bet colleges would think this looks really great. But, like, there's no way we would have finished it or done as well as we did because we went on to win again. Um, but yeah, and I, I mean, the I think process that, of it was was really what kept us going. Yeah. And then I, I don't you know, when it's healthy, the idea that somehow competition or winning things is bad, I think is crazy. Like we like so many of us love, you know, sports heroes because they're just so great at what they do. So it's and it's not like they're sitting at home going, I just have this inner drive to play basketball and I don't care what happens as a result. Like it's no, you, you have this inner drive because you love doing this, but it's also like, I want to be the best possible person out there at this. So right. I think in some areas, the natural competition is healthy. And then in some area, other areas, it wouldn't make sense to be focused on, Hey, I got to beat this other person mm-hmm. or something, you know? So, um, and I should say, I, I'm curious because you had mentioned about public school. So was this, this was a public mm-hmm. Montessori or you had transitioned out of Montessori? Like what happened there? Right. I had transitioned out of Montessori. The one in Maui only existed through upper elementary, so through fifth grade. And then after that, it was a matter of whether or not I wanted to go to a private middle school and high school or to public schools. And I chose public. Okay, so this I think I got to jump right into this because Mm -hmm. this question non it comes up almost every time I'm talking with a parent like and they're seriously thinking about Montessori. And even teachers in Montessori, they, some of them don't know because they're only in preschool age. They don't know what actually happens in a transition. So I've heard, I'm, let me just put it out there. What was it like for you? And then maybe we can talk bro- more broadly about it. It was, it was an adjustment for sure. Um, it, I mean, I basically I went from a school of 40 kids to a class of 400 kids. So it was, it was a big change. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there were a lot of things about going to a public elementary school where I was sheltered from a lot of what, I mean, sorry, did I say public? I'm going to a private elementary school. Mm-hmm. I was sheltered from a lot of things that were part of popular culture or just part of um, 
everyday life for other students. So like I had very little conception of what popular music was like. <laughs> I just remember being completely confused when someone would reference like Chris Cross. And I was like, I don't know who that is. Please explain. Oh, man, so, you, you really missed out then. I mean, because I'll tell you I, what, yeah. that is a negative if I've ever heard one, because I loved Chris Cross. <laughs> I mean, I eventually got there. And I mean, I, it wasn't like I was in a bubble. Like I did do extracurricular things and I did have friends who didn't go to Montessori. But it, there was a learning curve in that way in terms of keeping up with my peers so it took um, you a little bit to like memorize the lyrics of jump, jump, jump. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I know the jump, jump part, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of it, I, no. Yeah, exactly. It okay. just, it took a while. I don't think I ever did actually. Okay. Um, so in that sense, it took some time to get used to it. I think I, I actually chose to go to public school. Like my parents gave me that option, which was mm. really nice to them. Like I visited the private school that many of my um, Montessori classmates decided to go to. And I just decided it wasn't for me. Mm. So I think part of, part of why my transition actually ended up going very smoothly was because um, I got to make that choice for myself. Um, but what I credit the most for going really smoothly is that same girl uh, her name was Katrina or is mm. Katrina she she had transitioned out of Montessori after probably preschool now that I think about it and we did we just stayed friends and so mm. she'd made friends in her public elementary school mm. and we were both going to the same public intermediate school and so she was there and she already had a group who kind of welcomed me with open arms who were also placed in the like, gifted and talented classes. And um, that made the transition so much easier. Oh, so you had already had a friend that was there. So that, okay. Yeah, and yeah I can I think see that, that being helpful. The biggest difference. Yeah. And I wonder, because when I talk to parents about this, and it sounds similar, I mean, particularly because you were in fifth grade and you made the, you're the one making the decision whether I'm going to go to this school or that school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I so I should tell people out there, I think this is, again, another dependent on how, where your unique child is or the student is, because I definitely know some fifth graders even have made it through Montessori that would not be at the stage where they could make such a big decision. Um, but then there's other Montessori children that, man, if you were there, I mean, like yourself, Meredith, if you've there, been there since two years old. I mean, the Montessori classroom, it's like every day you've got to make choices for yourself. Do I want to mm -hmm. do this? When am I going to start that? Did I finish this? You know, so by the time you're in fifth grade, was that like 10 years old or so, you might very well be able to make such a big decision that even parents struggle with you. So it sounds like you went, you toured schools and you said, based on everything, this is the school that was going to be a fit for me. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, I mean, I don't really remember exactly what my reasoning was, but it just, I mean, it I could just, be, yeah, your, I just got the right sense. And it could be your I mean, friend it, was there, right? Like that could have been yeah, the, the major thing. Could so, be. yeah. So, I mean, and this, I don't know. Maybe I wanted something different too. Like being with the same 40 kids every day was fairly small. And the idea of doing that for another seven years just maybe I wanted something bigger. Yeah. Knows? And I've heard, and I think that's a, it's actually a valid concern, not only of children, but of parents. Like I know I started out in a very small school um, teaching and as amazing as, and I would have always chose that um, as compared to like, you know, all these kids in some other school and there's no education going on, but there's a valid concern that, Hey, if there's not a big group of kids, you, you're so limited in the number of people that you could potentially be friends with. Or I know in your case, like after a while, it is like, I want to branch out and meet other people. I want to see bigger things. Um, so I could totally see that being a, a thing in a child's life at that point. Um, particularly, I'd say, when junior high and high school comes about, because there's usually a little bit of a fear for children about the large school if they're transferring, but there's also an excitement of like, oh, I get to go to like a sports game or I get to do these different dances. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's a need for that at that age. So anyways, I'm, I, yeah. think I, I think I'm raising it because if there's parents out there that are kind of like, oh, well, I don't know what to do. I'm going to stay at my Montessori school. And there's like five kids in the graduating eighth grade class. Like what I would say is that school better be very, very, very good to keep you there with six kids in an eighth grade class. Or it's really good, and then you do outside activities that allow your child to actually inter interact with many more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that 
one other thing about my Montessori education or my experience is I hear that some people are very concerned about structure and whether or not their students learn structure or their children learn structure mm -hmm. in Montessori schools. And I, I mean, I feel like my school did a good job with that, but I also did gymnastics after school, which yeah. is probably one of the most structured experiences I've had in my life. Yep. So <laughs> those two things together, I think really helped out a lot. Yeah. And I, I'm ha I didn't know that you had done that and I'm happy mm -hmm. you're raising it because the idea that somehow the Montessori class classroom is like this panacea will solve every problem and make everything great. Like that's just a fairy tale because you need to go out there and like live life outside of the school as well. And I think it, like what you just said, if you're in gymnastics, I mean, my gosh, talk about like doing things day in and day out for a long-term goal or for achievement. Like that's huge. Um, mm -hmm. So, so for sure. So any parents, even teachers out there, like, man, get those kids out there in activities that they might enjoy, but it's also outside of the classroom environment for sure. So, yeah. yeah. And also just going back to transitioning from Montessori to a public school or any other kind of school. Mm -hmm. um, again, this might just be me being me, but I was so excited to actually have homework and take tests <laughs> <laughs> and do like what you see in school like in movies yeah um that was thrilling and i i actually during the summers when i was at montessori school i i used to like buy these worksheet books that i mm -hmm. just loved filling out because we had nothing like that at montessori yeah so the idea like that just that change and just being able to go out into a different place and see what happened was really exciting for me and i gotta say i'd love to tell you you're you're this rare bird in this case <laughs> but it is oh. like and it's almost like it almost like gets me upset, but I'm like, yeah, you got to follow the child like this is what they want. But this is a common thing I've heard about kids leaving, particularly when they're leaving at the upper ages. Like, I'm so excited to get homework because they 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 <laughs> hear about homework and tests outside and then even grades. You know, they're like, yes. So, um, of course, they haven't been hammered over their heads since they were in kindergarten or first grade. Like, you got to do this test. You so they don't know the the full experience, you know. But it's such a, it's like something new, like a new adventure, I think. So you're, yeah. uh, so you're not unique in that, that element, I can say. I so. love getting all of this context, Jesse. Thank you. Oh, I nice. have no yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I like hearing all of this, what, what you went through. So, so, you know, we, I think we've talked about a lot. Um, and I know, so intellect, intellectual curiosity stuck with me when we talked, I think like over a month ago, it was one of those ones. Is there anything else that, that just jumps at you as like this I, I got this from Montessori and it's helped me so much in my later life. Like we actually, we haven't really talked about what you do in later life. So if you want to, you know, talk a little bit about that or integrate it or. Right. Well, I'll answer your first question first, which is, is there anything else? And this wasn't something that I necessarily attributed to Montessori myself, but I was checking in with my parents just to see if there was something that I hadn't thought of or hadn't been aware of. Mm -hmm. Cause we all know how kids aren't really aware of the, bigger picture outside of themselves sometimes. Yep. Um, and my mom said that one thing she attributed to my Montessori education was just my willingness just to kind of stand up front uh, in front of people and not really be embarrassed. Hmm. She said that just she felt like she'd seen that in my um, succeeding life and that she felt like the fact that Montessori was such a supportive learning environment helped me, helped shield me from some of that self, some of those self-esteem issues or some of that self-consciousness that, that can come out in students. So do you mean like if you were like giving a presentation or a talk, like what, in what context would this come up? Yeah, it's in almost every context, but yeah, huh. mostly in like in high school, my band teacher, we were doing Peter and the Wolf. He was like, hey, do you want to read it? I was like, sure, I'll read that. Or like, yeah. I'm just answering questions in class or even doing this podcast. Like, it's just something like, it can feel a little uncomfortable sometimes, but it it just gives, I don't know, I just have this sense like, I can do this. So you it's, just do it. So this, I mean, I it's, not like, it. it's not like the, there's no fear at all, but it's like, I've got a little, oh man, this might be a little bit difficult, but I'm going to do it because I can do it. Right. And, yeah. and just those early experiences of doing that sort of thing in Montessori in a supportive learning environment where 
there wasn't really ridicule involved or a sense yeah. of being wrong or like making those associations, I yeah. think could stem back to Montessori for sure. Yeah. And I wonder just thinking about the classroom in Montessori that the kids, the, you know, if you're a little bit older or you know an activity, you're able to teach another child, a younger child, if they ask you about it. So you get, mm. you get real practice doing it day in and day out. Well, and the story that my mom told, cause I, which I think is a really good illustration of this is she said that I was in a gymnastics class and a girl had demonstrated some sort of new routine and the coaches asked if I would be interested or if anyone would be interested in trying it themselves. And I like immediately raised my hand and I did it too. And I was terrible. (laughs) I was like really bad, really like stiff and not good at all, but I could care less. I didn't care. Yeah, that's... which I think is the biggest part of it all, which is I was like, I just wanted to do it. So I did it. Yeah, we and I've talked about the building of the self of an individual's, you know, what, who am I? What's my personality kind of thing? Um, and man, like that, just that the fact that you're going to go up there, you mess up. And it's like either way, if I do it amazing or I mess up, it's like I'm going mm-hmm. at it. You know, it's yeah. such a. I mean, it's a lot. It's very rare for us as adults. It's tough. So um, there's a deep element of Montessori that's just it, it's so huge in life. If you get it at a young age, because it just develops up and mm-hmm. it just keeps growing. So, yeah, um, it's just a nice foundation to have. And so do you do you think I know that you're doing all sorts of things in your adult life? It's got I mean, that it just seems to connect with that. So I'm curious, like, do you do you connect it with some of the kind of more professional stuff you're doing now as an adult? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just going back to the intellectual curiosity part of it all, like I feel like that has actually been the driving force of my professional life, too. Like that is okay. really how I've made the choice of what I want to do, and it's what gives my work purpose. So, example there is um, in college, I was taking all of these film classes because it was something I was interested in, and I had terrible writer's block writing a paper about Toy Story. And I went to see Finding Nemo as a way to just kind of get my mind on other things. And I just remember having some sort of weird epiphany as I was watching all the fish swim through this beautiful (laughs) rendering of oceans. Just I was just like, this is incredible. This is so beautiful. And I realized that every single thing in that frame and in any animated movie was consciously put there. It was just something that that. I mean, there was nothing that could accidentally get in there. And I just realized I wanted to learn everything that there was about that. Um, And so that curiosity drove me to my first career, I guess I should say, which was to work in the animation industry, not necessarily as an animator because I didn't have those skills, but as a, we were called production supervisors, but that really built on my um, structural and organizational skills. Yeah. So it's just, you're kind of saying like, it's this question of what's going on in the back of your mind. That's kind of always moving. That curiosity is what you're kind of connecting here. Yeah. It's, it's like, I see something and I go, Oh my gosh, that is so interesting. How does that work? Yeah. What is, what is that all about? I want to learn everything there is to know about that. Okay. So it's like so, I, I go into find a Nemo and in this case, it's like, oh, this is a cute little fish. And then you're, you're like, how did that fish get that exact nose on the fish? Like it's, it had to be right. done deliberately. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. And so I ended up at DreamWorks Animation and not at Pixar, but the whole, the whole background behind everything is very similar. And all of a sudden I was in meetings about like how much chest hair to give a hippo or how shiny should this little glob of spit be and like it was just so funny that that was something that had to be talked about and it was exactly the sort of thing that I I was hoping that I would get to learn about oh that's great Uh, yeah and then that that same driving question like how how does that work or I want to learn everything there is to know about this thing that interests me is what's led to every other job I've had afterwards, which was after DreamWorks, I moved on to a, an app, um, a startup that made an app in San Francisco that helped people figure out what to do in their free time. Mm-hmm. So I, I figured I like doing things in my free time, like how do people make those decisions or yeah. how do you choose things to help people um, figure out what to do. Um, and then when that startup got acquired, I 
did my own thing for a little while and tried to figure out where else, where else my curiosity leads. And that just came straight back to other countries and travel, as you can see by my organizing of clothes, like that <laughs> never actually left me. So now that's where my focus is, is I want to learn everything there is to know about the travel industry and how, how you set up trips for people to go on and how, how they make decisions to yeah. go on those trips. Like, how do you make that successful and a good experience for everyone? It sounds like just listening to you, the, something comes to mind for me is that, I don't think I've framed it like this before, but Montessori is like the why never dies, mm. you know? And I think what happens with so many children, and it's just, it's, it's sad, but there, the young children, it doesn't matter what child you have or what student, it's almost always, why is that? Why is this? What is that? I just literally heard a kid say, why is the sky blue, mom? You know, like, it's kind of a funny question because so many kids mm -hmm. ask, but he literally just asked that um, a few days ago. I overheard that. And it, in Montessori, the idea is the why never dies. Like, it, it doesn't matter how old you are. And it sounds like wherever you're going in life, like, you're holding on to that. Like, it's a part of you. Yes. And I think that that why gives meaning to a job or a profession more mm -hmm. than just doing it for a paycheck, kind of like what yep. we were talking about with grades. Like it just it just helps you have a happier life, if that makes sense. Yep. No, I think it definitely does. Well, cool, Meredith. We've I mean, we've talked about a lot of different things here. I'm happy we got through a bunch. So um, is yeah. there anything is there anything else you want to throw out there or you think we've got got a bunch covered? Um, there's, there's one other thing, which Go for is, I mean, I'm aware that I've had a, a very lucky life and things have worked out really, really well for me. And I think it could sound like I come from a really privileged existence, like being able mm -hmm. to go to a Montessori school is not something that everybody gets to do. Um, and I actually did come from a fairly modest background. And one of the things that, that could be seen as a negative about Montessori is the same as any other p private school, which is that um, there tends to be a little more wealth in that realm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that did kind of play out in my Montessori experience where like we used everything that was in the classroom, but we were able to bring in our own like pens and pencil cases. And like all of a sudden, that became like a, a way for people in the school to differentiate themselves from each other. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, and like, it's interesting to me that that is what I remember because there were other displays of wealth that were so much more egregious. Like I'd go to my friend's homes and they had, they'd have swimming pools or like they'd have memberships to a country club. And like that didn't resonate with me really yeah. at all. Like I really enjoyed being able to take part in that when I was with them, but it was never really something that was, part of the world that I lived in mm -hmm. that it just wasn't something that I felt like I really wanted it or I felt jealous of, but I felt jealous of those pencil cases. Yeah. Um, so it's a small example of it, but it was something that I think the school needed to be aware of and my parents needed to be aware of. And the school actually, I think did a really great job with that. Like they eventually just said, no, you can't bring any of this stuff in. It's like causing too much trouble. You have okay. to use what materials are available in the classroom. Um, and the other way they mitigated it was for birthdays or for Valentine's Day. Like nobody was allowed to buy something for the rest of the school. Like we were all told that we needed to make things. So we all had to hand make Valentine's for everybody else in the class. And we all had to, for birthdays, we all had to write um, a little page in a book that was presented to the student that was like, I like X because she or he is X and yeah. draw a picture related to it. And so um, that actually had the positive for me, at least of really emphasizing thoughtfulness and just how big an impact thoughtfulness can have over material wealth. Yes. Yeah, so I, I wonder how much of this is, you know, it, particularly you saying making things in the classroom, because I know in Montessori classrooms, it's almost always the case that children are not allowed to bring outside things to use in the classroom. Mm. But the idea is that you have this environment, it's well prepared for you. But if there is something you want to make, then that's a potential in the classroom. 
And I think it, I don't think it's done to make this like kind of equalizing feel, but it's the idea that you have everything you need in this class and we don't need to like add in, oh, I need to get the, the coolest new pencil. It's like, no, you got a pencil in the classroom here. Um, and then in the long run, the idea is that, yeah, you might even like yourself, you might create something really cool because like finding Nemo as a movie, like I find that an awesome movie. Like if we all had to watch the same exact movie that every child in the world had to watch, like that might be a boring existence. So I think Montessori like starts with that idea that we're all have what we need here so that later as you build that, your sense of self, you can create awesome things in the world that might be unique. Um, so there, there might be an element of that in terms of just the maker element of a Montessori classroom that you want to create things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also with you like Montessori and I get this a lot from parents. It's often very expensive. Um, and what's, what's really wild about it is it's not like from what I've experienced, there's not like these greedy guys that are like, we're going to make all this money off of Montessori children. Um, although I am starting to see some of that, like people that are involved that don't really care about education, but they just want to, they know it's huge now. Um, but for the most part, it's just because it costs a lot of money to run a school. So like teachers cost, I mean, cause right now labor, it costs a lot of money to hire teachers. The materials are very expensive. So I think we 10, 15 years out, we might see, you know, classrooms where so many more children can come because it's brought down to that level, which should be cool. Mm -hmm. And another example actually was at a conference once and there was a teacher from a country in Africa and she had showed me some pictures. I was just like, oh, this is so beautiful. But they had made their own pink tower. So I don't know, Mary, if you remember the pink tower. I remember the pink tower. Yeah. So the pink tower is super expensive if you get it from like a really nice Montessori site. But this woman and at her school, they had carved the wood, used some pink paint and made their own pink towers. And it's so there's there's so much we can do with like like your teacher did. It's like forget about all these expensive, weird looking, you know, um, Valentine's Day cards that you go buy. Like Let's make something. So mm-hmm. I think it's not only the element of like, hey, let's do, some, let's do something where everybody can do it, but also that we can utilize what we have and do something really awesome without having to go out and just buy something generic. But I think no doubt what you're saying, like there's, there's some, particularly in different areas around our country and the world, obviously there's some disparities that some children are just not going to be able to have a Montessori classroom. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons I'm in this is to help to try to get as many children as possible to get this stuff. But we got to start by first getting some children in the classroom, you know, and if that, mm-hmm. ha- if that happens to be in af- more affluent areas, then that's, that's the way, that's the way it starts. Um, right. in my view, but, but yeah, well, it's cool. I mean, you're whatever school you went to, I've got it. What school is it? Cause I just got to give so, them props for back then. So yeah, they're, they're wonderful. It's the Montessori school of Maui. Okay. So I'll have to so look, when I went to there, like many other Montessori schools, um, they just operated out of different churches. Yeah. And yeah. now they, they've managed to buy their own property and they have a beautiful campus on Maui. It was so pretty, actually. My sister got married there a year oh, ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, under a oh, banyan tree. Oh, that is... How idyllic is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's like South Maui under a banyan tree <laughs> getting married. At Wonderful. the Montessori school where she attended elementary uh, school. Oh, yeah. man, that's crazy. <laughs> Oh, so I'm yeah. definitely gonna have to look this school up. I know things can, who knows, things can change and over the years. So who knows? But it sounds, it sounds wonderful. So I, I mean, if anything, I can only imagine it's gotten better as they've oh. had their own space to create and plant and. Oh, that's exist. cool. That's cool of you to say that too. I, I'll definitely try to maybe shoot this over to them um, because for a student to leave the school in this many years later and then her sister to get married there, that is. <laughs> I mean, I know teachers or anybody who's ahead of school or somebody who owns that place has got to just love mm. that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for spending the time, Meredith. Oh, uh, you're very pleasure, welcome. So. Can I, I actually just want to add one. Oh, one yeah. Throw it in. You seem, don't mind. No, go which for it. Is, which is this. We've talked a lot about Montessori being a great experience for me, and it definitely was. Um, but I also want to give kudos to my parents uh. because... Then on top of the Montessori experience, I think is really what has helped me find the success that I have in my later life. Mm-hmm. Like Montessori is great in the intellectual curiosity part of it all and in um, not necessarily 
emphasizing achievement for the sake of achievement, but that was really backed up by my parents, which they always just said, you know, do what you do, do your best, let the end result take care of itself. Yeah. And really allowing me to follow my intellectual curiosity from the organizing of clothes into country of origin. But like, even once I went to college, like there wasn't a lot of pressure to be a computer engineer or anything like that. They just yeah. kind of had the faith that I would find my way and I have, and I'm eternally grateful that that their influence on top of Montessori has just really been a blessing. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that. I think I mentioned briefly a few minutes ago, whatever it was, that Montessori is not the cure-all. Like mm-hmm. if your parents aren't in it, like for the child, like it sounds like your parents, like that's... Mm-hmm. From my, even my view, all this Montessori talk, it, at the core level, it's your parents. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm really happy that you added that in there. Um, I mean, I didn't go to Montessori, but you know, without my mom in particular, my dad was a good guy, but my mom in particular, um, such a huge influence. So it sounds like your parents were just, you know, top notch for you. So that's that's mm-hmm. great. So they still are. It's yeah, they're great. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, awesome, Meredith. Well, thank you again. <laughs> Great, great having you on and uh, best of luck in your new adventures wherever they're going to lead you. So, Thanks so much, Jesse. It's great talking to you. Coming out of my discussion with Meredith, I realized that we're nearing the one hour mark. So I'm going to just keep things where they are and not add much more here. If you have other questions or concerns about Montessori in the upper years or about transitioning out of Montessori school or really about anything, feel free to send them my way. Jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at MontessoriEducation.com. I can't promise I'll get to emails immediately, but I will definitely do my best. Now, if you enjoyed this episode of the Montessori Education Podcast or any of the other ones, please share with people you think might appreciate uh, as well. And just a quick big thanks to everyone listening who's written me with their excitement about the show or, you know, to those who've left reviews on Apple or other social media outlets. The podcast is really starting to have a sizable reach. And I mean, you guys are the ones that are making it happen. So again, thank you. Well, that's it. Until next time. Adios.